Well, guys, uh, I'm always excited. <laughs> that's uh, that's my goal go to is uh, just to be excited. I'm I'm really excited for for what the Lord is doing. Uh, last week, last Sunday was absolutely phenomenal. It was Pentecost Sunday. Um, we really encountered the presence of the Lord, and uh, I'm I'm still I'm still zinging from that. So so uh, just Lord, we ask for more of that. We ask for more of that. Um, so if you can, uh, if you got your Bibles with you, please turn them over to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter one. Um, this is just to get started. Uh, I think we're actually going to spend a lot of time over in Romans today, a little bit in Corinthians, uh, but we're going to start out with Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 1, and I'm going to start reading uh, out of 9 and 10, and it's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. So this is kind of the, the, the preface to the message, not really that it's a preface, but uh Go with me to Ecclesiastes again, 1, 9, and 10, and I'm going to read out of the King James first, and then after that I'm going to jump over to the New Living Translation. So uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9, uh, King James, it says, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. So that, for me, I really have to focus <laughs> to pay attention to what that says. So I'm going to jump over here to the New Living Translation, and it says, History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. There's nothing under the sun that is truly new. Uh, what can you point to that is new? How do you know it didn't already exist long ago? So with that being said, uh, I just want to talk about times, you know, times and seasons, the time that we're in right now. Uh, the Lord had really been laying it, um, laying it on our hearts that, that we were actually uh, in a Kairos time. And, and, and the word time actually broke down in the Greek has two meanings. There's two types of time, uh, but in our English translation, we only have the one word time. You have, uh, in the original text, you have uh, a chronos time, and that's a chronos time is a chronological order or a sequential timeline. And then you have what's called a Kairos time. In a Kairos time, it is the right or critical or opportune time. And, and here in Ecclesiastes, it says uh, there, there isn't anything new under the sun. And uh, who knows if, if it hadn't already existed long ago. So with that being said, <laughs> uh, history tends to repeat itself. There may be uh, some, some different... Uh, area or different sticking points, but generally it tends to repeat itself. So we're going to stay in the book of Ecclesiastes, and if you can turn with me over to chapter 3, that would be phenomenal. And uh, I think Rod just went over this actually not too long ago, so I, I think that it's funny how, how the Lord is awesome, and, and He has us kind of repeat things or go over things uh, to, to really help Him to stick with us. So Ecclesiastes chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 8, the overall here is there's a time for everything. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, out of New Living Translation, it says there's a time for everything, a season for every activity under the sun, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to harvest, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to tear down, and a time to rebuild. A time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away, a time to search and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be quiet and a time to speak up, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Um, what's that saying is that there is a time under the sun for every season. Uh, this morning, actually, uh, in prayer, the Lord was sharing with me that we're actually in a experiential time. And I'm like, wow, what's an experiential time? And it's a timeline that we're in. We're actually experiencing uh, parallels to, to, to biblical days, parallels to what the Israelites actually got to experience. So uh, what I wrote down here, it says, we're actually in a time of experiential time where both Kronos and Kairos 
are existing at the same exact time. That it's not that we're running in a chronological timeline or that it is the critical opportune time, but everything is, is coming together uh, as a pinnacle. And it's what it means is that both Kronos and Kairos, it's a time where critically right opportune time is in line with the sequential or chronological timeline. So everything is kind of coming together. It, it, it is the opportune time. It is, it is, we're in a really critical timeline and, and, and everything is right. Everything is ripe for, for a move of God. And then he, uh, and then the Lord actually, he reminded me of, of a word that came to this house, a prophetic word came to this house in, uh, in September, September of 2019. Uh, which is about nine months ago, and, and that has significance because, uh, you know, our calendar, uh, the Gregorian calendar that we function off of, the seasons that we seem to operate in is January to January. Well, the Hebraic calendar doesn't exactly line up January to January. The Hebraic calendar actually runs September to September. And so a lot of times uh, the Lord will give out uh, words or give out marching orders for things to come for what's upcoming in this year. And, uh, in September of 2019, the Lord said, uh, we're coming into a season of quantum acceleration that's going to require a more steadfast intimacy with him. And if you break that down, you know, we're coming into a season of quantum acceleration. That is the acceleration at the time of four that's going to require a more steadfast intimacy with him. How uh, do you be more steadfast intimately with the Lord is to, to, to be intimate with with him is to constantly be in communion with him, constantly be in relationship, constantly asking him what he's thinking, what's he saying, what are you doing, um, to constantly be in communion with him. And, and steadfast is more regular instead of just coming to visit with him on a Sunday. Uh, we actually, uh, I've stepped up uh, my game and, I, and I, I get up every morning at five o'clock and I try to spend at least an hour with the Lord before I get moving. And uh, or before the day gets going, and in that steadfast intimacy, uh, I've developed or he's developed with me a stronger relationship, a, a greater conversation, a greater communion. And in that greater communion, uh, we're, we're accelerating, we're, we're experiencing acceleration at the time of four. So that's pretty exciting. And uh, so that word came to Church on the Rock or came to this house in September of 2019. Now, let's fast forward to April 2020, and that's when uh, COVID-19 actually strike, strikes, or uh, that's when the pandemic really began to take off. And uh, when we say we're in an experiential timeline, uh, that caused us actually to go into quarantine. And uh, so when we was in quarantine in the, in the historical or chronological timeline, it caused us to actually experience Passover. And and usually we just, uh, we celebrate Passover. Well, this is the first time in, in, in history that, or actually in my history, uh, that we actually got to experience it just like the Israelites did in Exodus 12. And and that is just the beginning of why it was important to go over Ecclesiastes uh, 1, 9, and 10, where history really, merely repeats itself. And uh, so, after we so Passover was from uh, April eighth to April sixteenth, and just like the Israelites did, uh, we got to experience that. And then we had uh, Resurrection Sunday for us was April twelfth, and that was the death, burial, and resurrection uh, of Jesus, which is actually uh, sim. Well, it's symbol. Then in Exodus, it was symbolic of the lamb and the smearing of the blood over the doorposts. And in our now time, it's actually Jesus is uh, our 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 lamb. You know, it's Jesus's blood that was the lamb on the doorposts. Uh, so we got to also experience the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and that's uh, representative over also in Exodus 12 as part of the Passover. Then after the Passover, uh, the Israelites experienced uh, freedom from Egypt, and Egypt was actually a uh, bondage. They was in bondage to another nation, and we experientially have been in bondage to so many areas to so many things, whether it's idol worship, uh, idol gods, uh, you know, di disobeying the Lord. Uh, I mean, we have been in bondage in so many areas, uh, not just individually, but but the church as a whole, nationally, uh, where we've been in bondage to, to finances, to money, and, and uh, the Lord uh, is actually 
he delivered the Israelites out of Passover, um, and that was their freedom from bondage. And, and we, I believe, are actually in the, in the experiential timeline of being freed from bondage. And so uh, that, that in correlation is actually Exodus 13 and 14, if you want to take a look at that. And then after uh, they were set free from the nation of Egypt, uh, they actually left Egypt and they ended up at Mount Sinai. And it was on Mount Sinai they hung out for 40 days and for 40 nights and they received instruction from the Lord. And that's actually uh, when they came into... Uh, when they made when they made a pact with the Lord or uh, a covenant, it's when it's when you know the Lord said, "I'm going to ask you guys to do these things, and if you do these things, then I will be your God, and you will be my people." So it's at the at Mount Sinai that the Israelites made covenant with the Lord, uh, their God, which is our heavenly Father, and they received instructions. And so after we came out of Passover. Um, Passover occurred, we experienced it, and then because of the uh, coronavirus, we actually had stayed in our houses. Uh, we was, we, we, it was recommended that we quarantine, that we were on lockdown, that we stayed home, and it was a time of pressing into the Lord. Pressing into the Lord for instruction, pressing into the Lord for, for what are, you know, what do you want us to do? What do you want to do? There was a purification. We were purifying ourselves, getting right with the Lord, uh, a time of repentance, um, a time of purification to be able to handle a, a greater move of the Lord. And the Israelites experienced instruction from the Lord at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 and 20. And then uh, this was the really awesome part is just recently, uh, I believe it was, uh, let me see here, May 25th, we were still under restrictions in Passover for, uh, or not Passover, I'm sorry, Pentecost uh, for this year in, in 2020 was actually uh, May 31st. And we had been in lockdown and there hadn't been a whole lot going on. And what was so special about that is the president came over uh, the national airwaves and airwaves and uh, let everybody know that he was overriding the governors and that church was essential business. He did that on Friday, uh, May 22nd which I don't know if it was quite enough time for churches nationwide to really assemble, to come up with, you know, to reach out to all their people, emails, text messages, letters, uh, you know what I'm saying, put together services and let everybody know, hey, we're gathering and all of this stuff. So I don't think that we experienced the full effect, which would have been uh, of church as we know it, or church as a whole coming together to worship the Lord um, on May 20, I believe that would have been 5th. And so seven days later, or May 24th, um, I think it was May 24th, May 24th would have been Sunday, but then uh, May 31st was actually Pentecost Sunday, and what's so wild about that in our experiential timeline, our experiential timeline of uh, Kairos and Kronos coming together is this Pentecost was the first time the nation as a whole was allowed to come out of quarantine, come together with one voice and one accord and lift up the name Jesus. It was, it was when the church as a whole and the United States as a nation came out of lockdown or came out of quarantine and was allowed to worship the Lord, uh, the Lord Jesus and to lift high the name of Jesus and to bring glory and, and, and worship to God, to God Almighty and it was very, um, you can correlate that, you know, to Acts chapter 1 and 2. It was when the, you know, when the disciples, uh, when Jesus died, death, burial, and resurrection, and before his ascension, he actually told the disciples, hey, do not leave Jerusalem until you receive power. Do not leave Jerusalem until you receive power. I want you to tarry. I want you to stay. I want you to pray. I want you to fast. Press into the Lord, and he's going to encounter you. And that's the same thing that happened with us. We, we got to tarry. We got to stay in lockdown and quarantine. And then, and then we came out, uh, just like the 120 in the upper room, the nation of America got to lift up, the high, lift up high the name of Jesus, and we got to experience Pentecost. Last Sunday was amazing. Last Sunday was epic. Thank you, Lord. And, and, and if the best is yet to come and you're bringing us from glory to glory and, and that is our starting point, I'm so looking forward to, to what you're doing. Uh, so, so what's next? If we're in this experiential timeline of Kronos and Kairos, what is next? And if nothing is new under the sun and if history is tending to repeat itself, then we can 
look at the writing on the wall in our in our amazing Bible and in our amazing instruction book, and we can see that after they experienced uh, after the disciples and the 120 after they experienced uh, Pentecost. Uh, what they began to do was share the good news. Share the good news. Uh, after Pentecost, the disciples began sharing the good news, and they began making disciples. And that's pretty exciting. And so right now when we're running this parallel of what's going on in the Bible, we, if we're going to continue to follow uh, the pattern that has been unveiled during this specific time, then we, we, we need to consider that maybe we should begin uh, going back to the basics and preaching the good news. And uh, so, you know, we, we should follow the lead of the disciples and, and, and sharing the good news and making disciples. And, and you can take a look at that. That's actually in uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 14 through 41. But with that being said, I, I want to ask you a couple of questions, okay? I want to take a minute and ask a couple questions. I want you to think about these, these questions, okay? I want you to think about the good news, okay? What is the good news, first and foremost? We've heard it a hundred times, but my, my, my goal here is for you to be able to articulate the good news in your own verbiage, okay? So think about that. What is the good news? Now that you've thought about it for a few minutes, could you share that with me? Could you share that with a loved one? Could you share that with a stranger? And uh, let, let, let me ask you another question. This will be a little heavy, but, but it's okay. So if you say you love your family and your friends, but you don't share the good news with them, my question is, do you really love them? Do you really love them? So... What kind of love is willing to allow our friends and our family to spend eternity separated from God? It's, it's just a thought. I, I just want you to think about that. First of all, what is the good news? Second of all, could you articulate it and share that with me or with a loved one or with anybody else? And then since it's called the good news, um, since it is good news and, and, and you proclaim, we vocally say we love our family and we love our friends, yet we're not willing to share the good news with them. So, so that begs me to, to wonder, do I really love them the way that I say that I love them? Because by not sharing the good news, it actually, uh, you know, it, it's, it's giving an opportunity for eternal separation from God the Father. And that is not good news. <laughs> and that is not love. Uh, so if you can turn with me to Romans chapter one, uh, Romans chapter one, verses 16 and 17. All right. And, and there's a myriad of reasons that we don't share the good news with our friends and our loved ones. Uh, I would think that, you know, there's, there's fear of man, uh, there's shame. What are they going to think of me? Uh, man, this is just ridiculous. Uh, but sharing our faith is precious. I think that's one of the one of the greatest uh, one of the greatest loves that can be shown is to share something that we have encountered and to want others to experience those encounters as well. So uh, Romans chapter one verses sixteen it says, "For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ, for it is the power at work saving everyone who believes, Jews first and Gentiles second. This good news tells us how God makes us right in His sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. So this good news, the good news, what is the good news? The good news is the news that tells us how to make our relationship right with God. So that's pretty awesome. I mean, I did. Some people don't even know that they're not in right relationship with God. People don't even know that, that they're estranged from the Lord Almighty. But the good news is the information of, of how they can be made right with God. So uh, can you turn with me now to Romans chapter 10? Romans chapter 10. And we're going to read verses uh, 6 through 15. Romans chapter 10, verses 6 through 15. It says, but the way of getting right with God through faith says, 
you don't need to go to heaven to find Christ and bring him down here to help you. And it says, you don't need to go to the place of the dead to bring Christ back to life again. Salvation that comes from trusting Christ, which is the message we preach, is already within easy reach. In fact, the scriptures say, the message is close at hand, it is on your lips, and it is in your heart. For if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who believes in him will not be disappointed. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They all have the same Lord who generously gives his riches to all who ask for them. For anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in them if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless somebody tells them? So, <laughs> uh, it is important that we share the good news of how to be made right with God, with our loved ones, and with our friends. And uh, <clears throat> it's just... It is so important, and, and like I said, in this, in this Kronos and Kairos time, this experiential timeline of everything coming together, it is so important. Uh, the time is right, right now. Uh, everything, the atmosphere is primed for people to be, their hearts have been uh, softened or, or, or placed in a position to receive. <coughs> Excuse me. So... This good news is also in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15. If you can turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, 1 through 3. It says, Now let me remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then and still do now. For your faith is built on this wonderful message and it is the good news that saves you if you firmly believe it. Unless, of course, you believed something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. That Christ died for our sins just as the scriptures had said. Now that is Paul telling you what the good news is. And the good news is that Christ died for our sins. That's the good news. Also, uh, go back in Romans to Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, uh, verse 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us, that while we were still sinners. I'm going to start, I'm going to do that over. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. So, your friends, your family, heck, even you, <laughs> even you will go, I'm not a sinner. Your friends and your family will say that they're not sinners. And let me, let me ask you a question. You can ask them a question. Have you ever broke one of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20? Have you ever lied? Have you ever stretched the truth just a little bit, just a little bit exaggerated? Those are all sins. And Romans 3.23 Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned, and all fall short of God's glorious standard. <laughs> all have sinned. That is a powerful statement. For all have sinned, and all have fallen short of God's glorious standard. And in Romans 6.23 it says, The wages, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So if all of us have sinned and the wages of sin is death, that's kind of scary. That means if I sin, the payment for my sin is death. But the good news is that God has given us a free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's only through Jesus Christ. Uh, the word of the Lord says no man comes to the Father except for through the Son. It's only through Son that we have access to God the Father. So because we sinned, there has to be payment for this sin. There has to be payment for this said sin to be justified by God 
or even to be reconciled by God. Whenever there's sin, there has to be payment for that because God is apart from sin. God, there is no bad in God. There is no darkness in God. He is all light. There is no sin in him. And what good does, does lightness and darkness coincide? They can't. The goodness of God and, and sin do not go together. They are eternally separated. Sin is the eternal enemy to God. So if you could turn with me to uh, Romans chapter 3. I know we're going back and forth all over. I know there's a lot of scripture here, but uh, I've told you guys before, and I'll tell you again, I think it is so important for, for me to give more scripture than my opinion. For the word of God is sharper than to any two-edged sword to the dividing of the asunder of the soul and the spirit, dividing the joints and the marrow, separating the thoughts and the intents of our heart. It is so important to get the word of God, so uh, I'm, I'm just giving you the, the word. Uh, Romans chapter 3, uh, verses 25 and 26. We're really going to focus on 25. It says, For God sent Jesus to take punishment for our sins and to satisfy God's anger against us. We are made right with God when we believe that Jesus shed his blood, sacrificing his life for us. God was being entirely fair and just when he did not punish those who sinned in former times. And he is entirely fair and just in this present time when he declares sinners to be made right in his sight because they believe in Jesus. Guys, that's, <laughs> that is, that is, it is so important to believe in Jesus that, that, that mankind, uh, even all the way back in, into the garden uh, with Adam and Eve, Man sinned against God by disobeying him, and, and it pitted us against God. And because we sinned and we were pitted against God and what, what he asked us to do, or actually at that time it was what he asked us to not do, and uh, we did that anyway, uh, it caused us to sin against God. And, 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 and whenever there's sin, there's death. Uh, you know, the wages of sin is death, and we could not make that payment. We could not pay for the sins that we committed. Uh, you know, in the Old Testament, we had to sacrifice bulls and goats, and it was, it was the shedding of blood. For, for the Word of God says there's no remissions of sin without the shedding of blood. And so, thank God, Jesus came as a perfect sacrifice, as the spotless and, and blemishless Lamb of God and, and sacrifice. He gave Himself. He shed His blood on our behalf so that we could be made right with God, so that we could come back into communion with God, so that we could enter boldly into the throne room of grace and have right relationship and right standing. Lord Jesus, thank You for choosing to die on my behalf so that I could have a relationship with my eternal Father. God, thank you for giving Jesus even the opportunity to die on behalf of us so that we could all be, be one, be one. As you and Jesus are one, that we would understand that we are one with Jesus and with you. So I just want to share with you guys, again, I, uh, I want you to think about it. What is the good news? And I, I want you to begin to formulate or think about articulating this and how you could share this good news with with me or or with with a loved one and and even with a stranger even with a stranger you know the lord the word of the lord says uh you know for god so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life he says god so loved the world that he loved the world, and, and we need to love those in and of the world. And we need to give them the good news. We need to help them to understand that because of sin, they're, they're eternally separated from God, but there has been made a way uh, for, for reconciliation through, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the good news. And I want you guys to think about that because, again, in this uh, Kairos and Kronos moment of, of experiential timeline, the next thing, the next order of events is the disciples and, and you know, the 120 begin to preach the good news. Uh, they begin to share the good news with the world. And I think that's where we are uh, in, in our experiential timeline right now. So this, huh, this is the good news in one sentence. It's kind of a long sentence, uh, but it's all in one sentence. So the good news is that 
the just and merciful creator of the universe has looked upon sinful mankind and has sent his son, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, to bear his wrath against sin on the cross and to show his power over sin in the resurrection so that everyone who turns from their sins and themselves and turns to Jesus as Savior and Lord will be reconciled to God forever. I'm, I'm hoping that I can keep that condensed version to share with people quickly, quickly in short periods of time, and, and, and hoping that will entice questions, a Q&A, uh, you know, uh, just to, 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 to pique their curiosity. And, and I'm asking you guys to, to begin to develop something, maybe not just like that, but in your own words, develop the good news so that you can begin to share with the world that God loved and that God sent his son to die for, that we can begin to reconcile uh, uh, those lost individuals back to the Lord Almighty. Um, so what, what I want to say, guys, is, is uh, the great awakening is upon us right now. We have been looking for this great awakening. I'm telling you, the greatest, the, 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 the great awakening that we're looking for within our generation or our time, it is upon us right now. And I'm telling you right now, it's not going to look like thousands of people flocking to the church. What it is going to look like is the church flocking to thousands of people. Tons of people ain't going to come into this building. But this building is going to go out into the world, and we are going to proclaim, proclaim the gospel. We are going to proclaim the good news. And, uh, Lord Jesus, I just thank you. I thank you for that opportunity. So, again, th this is the experiential time of both Kronos and Kairos, meaning it is the critically right, opportune time in the sequential or chronological order to be like Paul. To be like Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 verses 5. I'm going to read this to you guys. It's the time. Everything is critical. And it is the opportune time. And hearts are moldable. Heart, people are looking for answers. And, and, and we need to help them to understand. It isn't, it isn't about... Uh, race. It isn't about sickness and disease and pandemics and, and what are we going to do with our money and we've lost everything. It has nothing to do with that. People are looking for answer, answers and, and, and the answers to sin. They're looking for why has this happened. It isn't any one particular thing. It's because of sin. We live in a lost and dying world and, and, and we have the answer. We need to share the answer. The answer is Jesus. And we need to share it just like Paul did. It is so simple. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 1 through 5, it says, This is Paul. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, when I first came to you, I did not use lofty words and brilliant ideas to tell you God's message. For I decided to concentrate only on Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. That is all Paul focused on was Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. He says in verse 3, I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling, and my message and my preaching were very plain. I did not use wise and persuasive speeches, but the Holy Spirit was powerful among you. I did this so that you might trust the power of God rather than human wisdom. Guys, it's that simple. I, I've listened to so many teachings. I've given so many teachings myself where I've tried to use wise and persuasive arguments. And Paul said it so simple. It's all about Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. And in that simplicity, the Holy Spirit was powerful among us. And that is what we're called to do. That is where we are in this experiential timeline. It is time for us again to go back to the basics and preach Christ in Christ alone. It is only through Christ that we can be reconciled to God. It is the only way. So, <laughs> sorry I'm amped. I'm so excited about it right now. I, I'm just so excited that, that the great awakening has occurred and it is time for us as the church to begin to declare the goodness of God. It is begin to declare the good news to a lost and dying world like we once did. And it is now the perfect time. It is ripe. People are ready to hear about justification to God through Jesus Christ and the cross. Let us pray, guys. Lord, I just thank you 
I thank you for this word. I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are allowing us to partner with you as you are wanting to encounter mankind, as you are wanting to release your love upon this nation, as you are wanting to release your love upon this world, Heavenly Father. And right now, I pray for boldness in sharing this good news, Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray for your healing power. I pray for the miraculous signs and wonders to be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Lord, I pray that they would, when people encounter us, they would encounter the miraculous. Lord, and I pray that you would give us boldness and courage. Boldness and courage, Heavenly Father, to proclaim to those that we say that we love, to proclaim to those friends that we say that are friends and we so care so deeply about them, Heavenly Father, that we would have the courage to share with them how much you love them and how important they are in your sight, Heavenly Father. And Lord, we just, I'm asking you that you would, that you would soften everybody's hearts, that you would continue to soften everybody's heart, Heavenly Father. Lord, and we just declare a spirit of unity over this nation, unity over this nation right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we ask these things. We ask these things. We love you. We love you. We love you. Huh. Oh, man. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Guys, I hope... I hope that this, uh, I don't even got a hope for this one. I know. <laughs> I know that this is the good news and this is the message for this time and this hour. And the Lord is looking for us to partner with him. So, so be blessed and be courageous and get out there and tell the people that we love, tell the people, our, our co-workers that we, that we care so dearly about, that we've developed relationships about. Let's not let them perish eternally separated from God, but let's share with him the good news. Guys, I look forward to seeing you. Uh, please feel free to come and join us. We are having in-house services, and uh, we, we are expecting mighty things. And so take this word, put it in your pocket, and begin developing your own, your own good news in your own speech, in your own articulation, and just continue to advance the kingdom of God. Be blessed, guys. I love you.